I went out of a guilty conscience. I live in New York now. I lived in Texas as a child. Although I live in New York, I'm reminded, as every other Negro must be in New York, that we're not free. I'm also reminded that as long as a door is closed to a men's waiting room that is marked colored in Jackson, Mississippi, I'm not free to go into Grand Central Station in New York City. I was to have tried to get onto the first Freedom bus that went down. People were injured on that bus. People were beaten in Alabama. This set up a guilt complex in me because Percy Sutton hadn't gone. Percy Sutton had stayed in New York. He excused himself by saying that he had work to do in the NAACP. He had cases in court. But deep down within Percy Sutton, he felt that he was afraid. And to live with Percy Sutton, I had to go. But I'll tell you the most cruel thing that I experienced was not being in jail in Jackson, Mississippi, as they tried to brainwash me, as they do all who go to Jackson, Mississippi. But it was a ride from Atlanta, Georgia, to Montgomery, Alabama. And the feeling of building fear as I rode in the front of the bus, just two of us, through hostile territory, a territory that I had been through before and which I had always ridden in the back of the bus because I didn't have guts to get in the front of the bus. But now the time has come. I was riding in the front of the bus. I don't remember how many hours it was from Atlanta, but if it was six hours, actually by trip, it was 60 hours of the fear of the mind. So much so, had this tension built up, that as we went through the countryside and we looked out, and I saw the red clay, we passed Tuskegee Institute, where I had gone to school and the segregated circumstances, where I had been in the for Air Force as a Negro cadet, where I had graduated as a Negro officer who could not eat in the white officers club as I prepared to go and fight the American cause. I looked at Tuskegee, I was so doggone scared, not afraid, scared, that I wanted to get off the bus, get out, and stay at Tuskegee. Tuskegee was a familiar name. Montgomery was a place of hostility. Montgomery, I remembered from 1940. I remembered Montgomery from the Capitol. It's the Capitol of Alabama. On the Capitol steps, a shoe shine board not more than 18. Head split open from behind and blood streaming, somehow gushing over the front of his face and down. This was 1940, but that has always symbolized Montgomery, Alabama to me. Finally, we arrived in Montgomery. We were going into Montgomery, as we later found out, in the face of a court order, a federal court order that said no one would go in as a freedom rider. This was Montgomery. This was the hostile Montgomery in which the beatings had just taken place a few days prior to this of the freedom riders. We pulled into the bus station of Montgomery, Alabama, and now the moment of truth had arrived. The bus pulled into the station. I got ready to get up as we started to stand on my legs. This is fear. Now, fear from what? Fear from riding into the bus station? No, fear compounded from Percy Sutton, who couldn't go to the white playground as a kid. Percy Sutton, who was put off a train as an officer, a captain, in Texarkana in 1945, when he had returned from fighting a war for his country. These were the fears that come up over the years. And what have they done to Percy Sutton? that had stilled his legs as effectively as if a nerve had been sat upon. And they were cold, and I had to massage my legs to get up, to get off the bus. And this was fear. Fear that no one else would experience except the Negro. Fear from conditioning, and it's a cruel sort. We got off the bus, we went into the bus station, and it isn't more 
than 50 to 100 steps between the bus and the lunch counter, the white lunch counter there. And I went then into the lunch counter, through the body of people into the white lunch counter, and we sat there, Mark Lane and Percy Sutton, white Mark Lane, Percy Sutton, Negro, sat at the lunch counter together. And there were a number of people sitting there, and we called to the lady for service. And the thing we decided to ask for was orange juice, because the orange juice was right there. And Mark Lane, sitting with me, frightened to death himself, said, Madam, I'd like to have some orange juice. And he screamed out orange juice and blurred it forth from him. And the lady looked at him with scorn, and she says, I'll serve you when I get through. Now, of course, those are harsh words, but they were pretty words to us, because we knew that we were going to be served at least. Then a few moments later, after indeed she was through serving everyone else, she came over to the counter and took two glasses of orange juice, slid them down the counter to us. And I tell you, that was the nicest warm orange juice I'd ever tasted because it marked the end.